Hey everyone, this is Ed Mitchell, broadcaster and web developer over at 4playernetwork.com, and this is my top 10 games of 2015. My number 10 is StarCraft II Legacy of the Void. When Blizzard first announced that its long-awaited sequel would have its three campaigns split up amongst three different releases, I among many other fans were pretty disappointed that we would have to wait god knows how long in order to be able to have the complete game. But after this year's release featuring my favorite race, the Protoss, I was pretty happy with the end results. In the campaign, the cinematics, just like all Blizzard cinematics, are absolutely stunning. The Spear of Adun abilities that you get are fun, powerful, and useful to get yourself out of tight spots like if you run out of supply or you need to shield all your units before they go into battle. The added time between releases allowed the team to work hard on making each mission feel unique. You get the missions where you control your hero characters, a tower defense horde mode mission where you try to hold out as long as possible, and just other mission alternate objectives that kind of spice up the generic RTS gameplay of gather resources, build army, and attack enemy base. This expansion also added co-op missions where you get to choose between different heroes such as Jim Raynor, Arctanis, and Kerrigan, each with their own unit and ability restrictions. And as you play them, you level them up, which unlocks more different abilities, including ones that you haven't really seen before in any of the campaigns. Unfortunately, the co-op missions end up falling a little flat because of the lack of mission variety. You only get seven missions to choose from to start out with, and they all feel pretty much the same, where you're either defending your base from waves of enemies, or you're just waiting for a while while more enemies spawn and you just go out and attack them. While I'm no expert on the multiplayer, mostly because I'm not very good at it, they did add a few new units that I'm really excited to try out again. Like the old school rehash and the lurker, some newer spin-off versions of currently existing units like the Ravager and the Adept, and some powerful harassers in the Disruptor and the Liberator. Ultimately for me, the pros of the excellent presentation, the beautiful cinematics, and the still great gameplay outweigh the cons of the lackluster storytelling and writing. And considering this is one of the most fun games that I've played all year, I think that alone qualifies it for a spot on my top 10 list. For the reckoning. Ronin is one of those games that feels so much like other games at first glance. In fact, when I first started playing it at PAX South, I looked at it and was like, this looks a little bit like Gunpoint, and even the uh, way you traverse through levels feels and behaves very similar to how Gunpoint did. You have the ability to climb on walls, you have the ability to jump really high and far distances just by using the right thumbstick. It, but once you start to play it and you start to get a feeling about the, the turn-based combat, it really starts to pull itself away from other games that it's been compared to, like Mark of the Ninja. Just like Mark of the Ninja, you play this sword-wielding badass that's kind of out for revenge. But it doesn't really go much deeper into the story at all. It's just, It kind of really focuses on its gameplay rather than depending on the story to, to kind of carry it. The turn-based gameplay that you play with during this game makes you approach each room as a puzzle, where as you approach a room, and as long as you're not caught in any, any way, everything's in real time, but as soon as you get caught by an enemy, you're thrown into this turn-based back and forth where you can see where other people are aiming, and you're constantly having to think multiple steps ahead to get yourself in the position where, oh, I'm going to knock down this guy, and then this guy's going to shoot at me, but I'm going to make sure I'm just below his line of sight so he won't be able to hit me, and then I'm going to jump over to him and kill him while the other guy is getting back up. And once you get further and further in the game, you it 
you enter these really complex rooms where there's a ton of enemies and they all see you at once and you're jumping back and forth but what's really really cool about this game is that you unlock these skill trees and with the skill trees you unlock these really cool abilities like the ability to create clones for yourself throwing your sword and eventually you get the ability to just teleport from one enemy to another as long as they're in your line of sight and all these things put together kind of bring apart bring together into this package of this very nice mix of strategy and action and and just fun when you're trying to figure out what the next step that you want to do when you're taking down these bad guys my number eight is xenoblade chronicles x now, if you had asked me when the year began what was my most anticipated game of 2015, I probably would have said this game. Because Xenoblade Chronicles, the original, is probably in my top 10 favorite games of all time. And I can honestly say now that I've played a, wa a little bit of it, it doesn't really match up to the hype of Xenoblade Chronicles. Xenoblade Chronicles, at the very start of the game, you play for like only an hour or two before something crazy happens in the story and at that point I was sold on the game and I wanted to keep playing it and I didn't really get that feeling in this game until about 30 hours in once I was all the way in chapter 5 but once I took a step back and kind of thought about the game and what I, how I felt about it I can say that it still has the same combat system from Xenoblade Chronicles that I liked but wasn't in love with, but it added a whole new layer of complexity and customization on top of the system that Xenoblade Chronicles did very well. You have these abilities that you can unlock as you level up, but you also have these branching class trees and the ability to unlock more weapons once you maximize a class and then you can use those weapons forever. And that kind of kind of complex nature of a JRPG was something that I was really looking forward to this year, especially since there are not many other crazy, fantastic JRPGs that were coming out ever since they delayed Final Fantasy XV. So I started playing this game, I really, really liked it, and I'm going to keep playing it because I haven't finished it yet, and the story has now started to grab me, and I think that that along with this beautiful open world that I want to keep exploring and will continue to explore as I unlock the ability to fly in my scale, as well as just when I first unlock the scale, it really opens up the world to more and different possibilities, which when you first start out looking at the game, you're like, oh my gosh, this world is huge, I can barely cover it, I have to walk so far between place to place, but the scales really open up the world and give you more possibilities, which is something I really, really like about this game, and really makes me want to keep playing. Number 7 for me is Tales from the Borderlands. While I've never been a huge fan of Telltale's release cycle, I can say that I think the strength of their games is mostly dependent on the strength of the IP that they choose. Borderlands is one of those games where I actually like the IP and the idea a lot more than I like the gameplay. And considering that the Telltale games are basically all story and no gameplay, I think that's a huge plus for this game. I ended up waiting till the very end of the year when all the episodes had come out to play this game, and I think that's probably the best way to play it. You start off and you're playing as these two characters, Reese, a Hyperion, just lower level programmer kind of person, and Fiona, who's a con artist that lives on Pandora. And you end up falling in love with these characters and their interactions. Like, at the very beginning of this game, you're given a loader by which, if you're familiar with the Borderlands enemies at all, you know that they kind of wax philosophically a little bit, but not to the extent that this character is. They mention that when you first see them that the loader bots have become sort of a little bit more thoughtful and you you make a choice to either make him explode to kill off these enemies so you won't have to deal with them later at which point he'll just be angry at you for the rest of the chapter or you can tell him to just run away and he ends up becoming your best friend he's like oh my gosh you're the best ever and just the 
number of characters that you have in this game, their interactions with each other, it really, really feels like a world that's that's kind of lived in, which is not really something you can say about these kinds of games where you just feel like you're in a small box and just kind of interacting with your individual characters. So ultimately, this game, it's funny, and previous Tailtown games seem like they're taking themselves a little too seriously. This game is not at all, and I really think it's recommended for anyone who's a fan of Telltale or who's even just a fan of Borderlands to really give this a try, and I think you'll really like it because it's it has something special in it that I don't think a lot of other games do. Not to mention, the soundtrack is awesome. Have you ever wanted to sit in a room with a bomb that is constantly ticking down to zero while your friends bumble around in the background on Skype while you try to solve and read to them the different modules of the bomb? No? Well, Keep Talking Nobody Explodes is actually a game that I played at PAX Prime for the first time, and it was so good that I wanted to go back three or four different times to go play it again. And once the game came out, I bought it immediately and went and called up my friend on Skype like, Yo, we need to play this game right now. We played it at PAX. We both loved it. So let's play this game right now. And so we spent the rest of the night just going through each individual bomb and fusing each one and learning the different kind of tricks to each one. And we eventually got to this point where we just could not go any further and we needed an additional person. We got to this bomb where... There were so many modules and it was so complicated that we got to like the very last module and we were running out of time and we just felt like it wasn't worth our time to try and um, do it without another person. And so what ended up happening was I talked with some of my other friends that were also at PAX and we all ended up getting together on one Skype call while some of them had the notebook printed out and binded together in a nice little binder that was labeled and easy to get to. And we just had a blast just staying up late in the night, all working on these bombs and trying to solve the, the final bomb. And we end up getting to the final bomb, defusing it, and having 0.4 seconds left on the clock. And I just remember afterwards, it was 4 in the morning, and I go, YES! As loud as I can! And I was like, oh wait, I probably woke up some other people in the house. But that's okay. So, I can really say that this is an excellent party game, fun to play with your friends. You can play it over Skype, you can play it in person, just as long as no one can see the other person's screen. And I definitely think this game is worth everyone's time to go out and play it, because that moment where I solved that final bomb with that little amount of time left is probably one of the greatest moments of the year for me in video games. So, go out, buy it, it's totally worth it. Ori and the Blind Forest is one of those games that as soon as you boot it up and are treated to this beautiful start menu of this extravagant landscape with this huge tree in the background, you pretty much know what you're in for from the start. As the game begins, you're given this touching opening cutscene between Ori and this maternal figure until eventually something happens and then Ori is off on his own trying to explore this huge world and restore balance to nature or whatever. But it's not just the cinematics and the story that's engaging in this game, it's the, the combat and the traversal and the way you move around the world. You start off with just this basic attack that is basically just you mashing the X button over and over again and you only have the ability to jump a little bit but as you go further in this game you unlock the ability to climb on walls to run up walls to whenever you're shot with a projectile you can slow down time and shoot off in the direction you're trying to go to and all of this put together makes it really satisfying the way you have to move from one end of the map and if you're a completionist like me you spend a lot of time going from one part of the world to the other as you unlock new abilities and you end up traveling really slow at the beginning but as you get further and further you travel around so much faster and you end up getting from one side of the map to the other without even realizing it's been that long and Honestly, I don't have much more to say about this game besides you just really should go out and buy it and experience it for yourself because it's really one of the most touching experiences of the year. My number four game of 2015 is Rocket League. As someone who really isn't into cars and not a huge fan of soccer or sports games in general, I was surprised that after spending a night playing 15-22's games with a friend, I immediately tweeted afterwards about it being a life-changing experience. 
Rocket League takes all the fun stuff of soccer, the crazy saves and insane goals, and turns it up to 11 by adding rocket-powered cars instead of people. Matches are short, which I think adds a little bit of intensity to the already exciting gameplay, and they give the game a drop-in, drop-out feeling where you are, you're able to come home from work, spend about half an hour playing a few matches, and you don't feel like you have to spend hours and hours to get a full gameplay experience. Every moment in the games feel like they matter. And considering how many matches that I played ended up very, very close within one point of each other or in sudden death, it really matters up until the last second. And these moments feel so cool. It's like every 30 seconds you end up doing something just that just feels awesome. Whether it's blowing up an opponent's car, getting a crazy save from across the map by boosting all the way and just hitting it at the really last second right before it goes in, or using your rocket boosters yourself to fly across the map and score a goal. All these moments just create these emotions where, even if you're not very good at the game, you can still do something that seems so supernatural that as soon as it happens you end up jumping off the couch going, Yeah! Did you see that? Did that really just happen? I just scored that goal! That was amazing! But Rocket League really is a game about those emotions. The constant back and forth between the highs and the lows is invigorating. And just talking about it makes me want to dive back in and just spend hours and hours playing the same gameplay over and over again. And you'd think you'd get bored of it, but you really don't. My number three favorite game for the year is Life is Strange. Now, I'm not a huge fan of episodic games in general. I feel like I have to wait for all the episodes to come out before I really feel like I can get into the story because I'll just be left off on a cliffhanger and then forget about it by the time the next episode comes out. But I actually didn't do that with this game. I, I played through the first two episodes, waited a little while, and once the fourth episode came out, I played through the next two. And I actually feel like this game does the episodic thing really well. Each individual episode has its own story, motivations and atmosphere that's very different from the other episodes, but they all tie together really nicely into the overall plot. And that's not the only thing that Life is Strange does better than other games like it. The gameplay itself is something that's a lot higher and more involved than any of the Telltale games are, especially because in the Telltale games you're given these on-the-minute choices. And Life is Strange does it completely differently. When you make these choices, you get the ability to rewind and maybe try a different way. And you're able to explore the immediate outcomes and consequences of your actions. And then you're able to rewind back and just and try it again in a different way. And it allows you to kind of feel like the game is going is moving a little bit slower than like a Telltale game does. And that actually does well for its benefit. There are many moments in this game where you're actually encouraged to just kind of sit down and the background sound all kind of fades to really low. And all you're given is some background music while Max kind of has an internal monologue about her inner thoughts and the way she's feeling about these powers that she has. And I think it makes the game and the story and the environment just feel really real. You feel for these characters and the problems that they go through in high school that th there's a character in this game for everyone and everyone can relate to a person's struggles that they have because let's admit it, we've all been in these kind of situations. We might not all have time rewinding powers, but we all feel like we're kind of outcast in a way. And Max's desire to kind of want to fit in with this complex social structure that's in this high school is something that anyone can really relate to. And Life is Strange is by no means a perfect game. Some of the writing and the dialogue can be a little cringeworthy sometimes, but I think if you rise above those kinds of small little nitpicky things, you can really just sit back and enjoy this game for what it is and what it's trying to do. And I think what's really most important is you understand the motivations of these characters and you really feel for them and you want them to find resolution in their lives. And that's just not something that I really get in a lot of games nowadays. And I think that is kind of what pulls this game apart and made and makes it so important to me that it, it ended up being my number three game of the year. You have powers. I'll take that. Who doesn't love playing video games where you feel like a total badass and can easily take down the most dangerous of monsters? The Witcher 3 gets the number two spot on my list because I feel like it does something differently than a lot of other open world games. 
There's a lot of games where you're either left with one or two choices. Either the main story is so good, and the side stuff is just, oh, go collect a bunch of feathers, or light a bunch of towers, and expand the map. Or, the side stuff is so good, that the main story is just kind of lacking in, in general, and you don't really feel like the need to play that part of the game. I really feel like The Witcher 3 does well to combine the best elements of both. The side stuff you do feels real. Whenever someone comes up and talks to you and they're like begging you to help them, you really feel like you're their last hope. And once you complete the quest, you made their lives better and you made the world better as a result. And the main story is really compelling too. The search for Siri is something that, while me coming from someone who hasn't played the last two games and hasn't read the books, you feel for Geralt and you want to find Ciri just as much as he does. And that kind of balance between excellent side stuff to do and wanting to continue in the main story is just something that you don't see very often. And it's not just the questing structure that this game does really well. The combat and the exploration and just like while you're in this world you feel like a witcher because you get the ability to just kind of listen for things in the distance and Maybe after a while you can start to identify the type of monster that it is and you can prepare by drinking potions beforehand. This game is really good at making you feel like you're just as smart and just as able to take on these monsters as a witcher would in the world. And I don't know exactly what it is about this game, but when it throws just a bunch of vocabulary and stuff at you, you really just don't care. There's a quest where there's this guy who beats his wife until he, she has a miscarriage, and they go bury the thing out back, and then it becomes some sort of grumble snoot, and Geralt's like, oh, there's probably a grumble snoot, but we needed him to turn into a fart fignugan in order for us to be able to figure out what happened to Siri. so... And... <laughs> You don't care about this jargon because you're just so wrapped up in the interactions between characters and really that's what this game is about. It's about exploring this world, feeling like it's lived in, and you as a player just really wants to make the world better. And I mean, Gwent, am I right? My number one game of the year is Bloodborne. It's been a long time since I played a game that's made me want to not do anything else but play that particular game. I would be sitting at work going like, oh, just like, when is this day going to be over so I can go home and play Bloodborne? There's something just so addicting about this game. And I assume the other Souls games that you enter an area and you're very slowly working your way through it and you're killing monsters and, and killing enemies and gathering souls and going back and forth and then you die. And then you go back and try to get up to the part you are, go a little bit further and then you die. And you would think this type of gameplay would get tiresome after a while, but it doesn't. It's There's something unique about it that you feel like, oh, if I just go a little bit further, I just get a little bit further, then next time... I'll be able to kill the boss. Next time I'll be able to get past this one part and explore this other area. And that kind of behavior, it doesn't matter how good or how strong you get, every new area that you go to just has the same feeling again. The same feeling of, oh I need to explore this, I need to go to every nook and cranny and find these items and explore this world. And considering that this is my very first Souls game. I feel like I have been missing out on these fantastic games and I just know that with Dark Souls 3 coming out next year I'm just so excited to get back into it and I'm gonna go back and play the original Dark Souls and Dark Souls 2 and I don't know if I'm gonna have enough time to finish them but I just want more and more Souls games. There's something that's just so satisfying of the weapons that you get in this game and their special abilities and the way they switch between different types and the guns and the way you if you hit someone just at the right moment with your gun, you stun them and then you can do this special awesome attack. And I just absolutely cannot get over the fact of how much fun I had. Every day I would come home, immediately boot up and play it all night until I go to sleep. And I just haven't gotten that feeling in a game in a very long time. And that's just something that this game does really well. You feel very methodical in every move that you make. And if you choose to attack rather than dodge out of the way, you, you get hurt for it. And it's hard for me to kind of put into words how I feel about this game because it's not something I've felt before in a video game. And 
I just want more. I want to keep playing. I, I, I'm disappointed in myself that I didn't go back and play the expansion. So I think that I'm just going to wrap this up and then just go play the expansion. Everything in Bloodborne is just great. The level design, the enemy design, the bosses. Bloodborne is awesome, guys. If you haven't played it yet, you owe it to yourself to play my game of the year. And that's it, guys. This has been a fantastic year for video games, a fantastic year for the website. And I just want to thank the community for welcoming me and treating me just like they do any of the other guys. And I really appreciate it, guys. And I look forward to a fantastic 2016.